Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. Okay, okay, it's happened twice now, so let's be really, really clear. This voice is Troy. I don't know what you're talking about, Marcus. Why are you pretending to be me? (laughs) (laughs) Well, in case case you're struggling, I'm the better looking one. Oh, right. So we're going to go down that. Especially if you're only listening to the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Alex always tells me I've got the perfect face for radio. So I I know exactly where my place is. Well, you know that I've been envious about your voice for a long time. Not about your face, but your voice for sure. Yeah. (laughs) There you go. Right. Okay. Uh, enough of the uh, the mutual love fest here. Who's on the show today? So today we're talking to the lovely Liz Wiseman and her book Impact Players. Uh, what were your takeaways? Yeah, um, I really, really enjoyed the conversation with her. Um, we have a bit of history as we kind of established in the early part of the show that we both used to work for Oracle. Um, uh, at one point, one of the questions was. Can you actually have an entire team of of impact players? And I told a, another story, and her kind of retort to that was, "Prima donnas are not guaranteed to be impact players." And I said, "You know that just that rings true so much. You can have really, really incredibly bright people that do indeed add value, but it doesn't make them an impact player the way that she defines them." And the other one was, you know, if you come in with a fire in your belly and you're really trying to get out there and you're trying to make an impact and you've read the book, and you're trying to apply all of these great things. And you've got a manager that is holding you back. And she calls these managers diminishers versus multipliers. Um, and I'll point out, this is her fourth book. It's not even out until October. And she has another book called Multipliers. I think is, is also probably worth a read for us at some point in the future. But she says, diminishing managers, rather than trying to fight them, embrace them, pull them in, build their trust, and then you can be more more impactful. But th- those were my takeaways. What about you? So um, I'm going to use, oddly, the last question. So if you want to check that one out, you have to watch uh, and, and listen to the actual whole podcast to get to the last question about fuzzies. Um, so she told this really compelling yet, yeah, somewhat interesting story about sort of being divided between was it techies and fuzzies or something? Yeah. So everyone who was tech, fuzzies. newly hired on some kind of onboarding social thing over at Oracle was going to one side and the fuzzies to the other. And she ended up in the fuzzy section because she didn't feel like a, a techie. And it gave her a lot of insight into how the company saw certain skill sets and therefore likely opinions and expertise. And and she managed to amazingly turn it around. And uh, I find it really... It's quite compelling because I think a lot of times we, we feel probably like one of those fuzzies in a room trying to, uh, you know, explore what really should be done and think we've discovered it and trying to be listened to. And if our credibility is not quite there because people don't know you yet, it can be very, very tricky to be a fuzzy. So I loved the fuzzy story because I think everyone's felt like that at least once in their life. Do you know where the word fuzzies comes from? Um, no, but I, oddly enough, the only refer- the only other reference I have to is that actually often designers work and a lot of service designers struggle with that is that design is often perceived as, or that's just, oh no, it's fluff, not fuss. Sorry. That story right. just broke down very quickly, but maybe similar. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, there were stress balls and there were two kinds of stress balls. There were the warm, fuzzy stress balls that made you feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside. Oh. And there was the cold and prickly kind of stress balls. And so the question was, were you wanting to be a warm fuzzy or were you wanting to be a cold prickly? And so as much as she Jesus understood <laughs> that it was not what was valued in the company at that moment in time, it was not necessarily a, a negative thing. But Marcus, you know, oh. she's got so many great insights. Why don't we go and listen to her tell us more about impact players? Let's go to the interview. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. We use Sandcaster for all our audio and video recording, and it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels 
for very easy editing. Suncast is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat, Wicked Podcast for 40% off. And now the interview. Hello, everyone. Today we're here with Liz Wiseman. Hello, Liz. Welcome to the show and thank you for making time for us. Oh, well, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I have a feeling this is going to be an interesting conversation. <laughs> we will see about that. So, um, uh, as we usual, uh, as usual, we start on the top. So, please tell our listeners who you are and why you wrote the book. Okay. Well, um, I'm Liz Wiseman. I am a researcher and executive advisor, teacher, and you know, my job is basically research, write, teach, repeat, and. Um, I wrote the book because my, you know, I've come to um, my research from being a corporate executive myself. And, you know, all of my work and all my research and writing is all around how do we utilize talent really fully inside of organizations. My first book was uh, Multipliers, where I looked at a leader's action and particularly how they use their intelligence can either have a diminishing or multiplying effect on people around them. And I've spent the last 10 years running around the world teaching leaders what they can do to better utilize the intelligence and capability of their teams. You know, like how to not be a diminisher, how to be a multiplier, how to not accidentally diminish your team. And, you know, at some point in that journey and working with leaders, I realized that it's actually, you know, leaders have a huge role in how fully people get utilized how engaged they are, um, the kind of influence and impact they can have in their work. Like to a great degree, it's a function of the leader, but it's not all about the leader. And I wrote this book because there's really the other side of the story to tell and the way that a contributor thinks and how they show up matters as well. And, you know, probably the point in the journey where I most realized that there was something on the other side, um, at the table was when a manager is a tech executive and he's learning about multipliers. He's like, yeah, but you can't multiply zero. I'm like, Ooh, that's harsh. That's harsh. Like, what are you saying about your team? And I thought he was being like, Hey, you know what? I got low talent I'm working with here. And it wasn't his message at all. He's like, yeah, I need to show up like with the right kind of approach, but so do the people who work for me. And, you know, I think I started to realize there are, there are some people who are a lot easier to lead. You know, an ounce of good leadership goes a really long way. And then there are people who are kind of preventing themselves from playing to their full mm. capability. And so the book is about what can you do to kind of show up, play big, have an impact, do meaningful work. And I think it's it's a really it's a great book. Obviously, you've written. I guess this is your fourth book. It's my fourth book. Your, your fourth book. So the the publisher perish thing. You seem to have gotten that one kind of down pat. So you're doing lots and lots of of publishing. Well, only because I enjoy it. You know, I finished my first book, and you know, I had written nothing longer than an email note before I wrote my first book, and I'm like, oh, I hope the publisher doesn't like really know that I don't know how to write. Right. And, you know, I got through that first project project, and, you know, finished the book. And I said, oh, I think I like have the writing bug. And my publisher says, oh, no, you have the writing gene. Like, wow. you know, like you're kind of. And I think it's like it's my mind is built to do this, which is I it's my mind is built to go from I don't know to I have something to say. OK, Um so um, we, we had a, a brief conversation kind of in the, in the warm up before we actually hit the, the magic big bright red kind of record button, but I failed to disclose something. I am also Ooh. a recovering Oracle employee. And you, oh. you, you mentioned that in the, in the beginning of your book that you also worked for Oracle and did a bit of corporate training and development at Oracle. And I've been through many of their online compliance trainings Okay. So I, I know a fair bit about that side of things. But Oracle yeah, treated I, me incredibly no. well when I exited from Oracle. So I have nothing nothing bad to say, but it's always a good joke of being a recovering Oracle employee. 
Yeah, well, people joke that my first book was my post oracle therapy. It was me making <laughs> sense of this experience I had where there are all these amazingly smart people, but yet I saw how some leaders just um, diminished, sucked the life out of some of those brilliant people. And so I think like all of my work really comes down to I hate it when really smart people don't get to be smart. Like it really, it really angers me okay, so when I that, see that leads talent me to, get wasted. That, that leads me to the first question. And I'd written it one way, but having heard you just now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase my first question, which is as a person who wants to be an impact player, how do you best deal with a leader who feels threatened when you do impact player sort of things and tries to shut mm -hmm. down and minimize or keep you from being as brilliant as as what you want to be and i know a lot of millennials that want to be amazing they want to you know day two they want to be vice president and fully impact and making massive decisions and some leaders hmm, i don't know if there was a mirror one of them might be me saying you know what there's a bit of dues paying that needs to be done a bit of investment yeah, that needs like, to be done. slow down honey slow Just down slow down yeah but but if you want to be an impact player and you've got that fire in your belly what do you do when you got a leader who kind of either squashes you or ignores you or puts you in the corner? Mm, yeah. So now we're in the range of like, you are bringing your game to work, but you've got someone who's, who's holding you back for one reason or another. You're dealing with a diminisher. And, you know, this is actually the reason why I did a second edition of multipliers because I, I put in there a chapter on how do you deal with leaders who are, micromanaging or holding you back, um, shutting you down. And, you know, I'm going to try to sum it up. There's all chapter in there. There's like these 13 practices, including like defenses against the dark arts of diminishing leadership and, and such. But I'm going to see if I can sum that up with um, a reference to, you know, this, a lot of people see in the Seinfeld series, like there's this one kind of iconic episode where George Costanza, who's always screwing everything up at work, like, you know, he decides that he's going to do the exact opposite of what he thinks he should do in every situation. And it turns out to be just brilliant. Do you know this episode? Do you remember? So the way that we handle micromanaging, know-it-all, diminishing kind of limiting sort of leaders, like most of what we do ends up exacerbating the problem. Like, you know, the heart, if you try to push against someone who's trying to hold you back, what do they do? Push They're going to push harder to hold you back. What happens when you argue with a know-it-all? Like what happens when you try to keep a micromanaging boss at bay? Like they're just going to push harder. And in some ways we should do exactly the opposite of what we want to do. Mm. So what we want to do is say, you know what? Give me some space, move over, let me work. And what we're better off doing is inviting them in because they probably feel insecure. Like, well, wait a minute. If you like show up big, is that going to make me look bad? You know, are you going to like, are you gunning for my job? So like you actually want to pull them in close so that they feel comfortable around you. Like, wow, I'm not going to get blindsided by this. Like if you win, I win too. I get to be part of the success. Um, you know, also if you, um, you know, you come in like gunning to do your thing you know, you might want to do exactly the opposite, which is figure out what your boss's thing is and do it. And, you know, I got this experience at Oracle where I came in all passionate about leadership development. And I'm like, you know what? I want to build a management boot camp for Oracle. Like, this is my thing. And my VP, fortunately, he kind of said, you know what, Liz, that's great. But your boss has a different problem. Your boss has got to figure out how to get 2000 new hires up to speed in Oracle technology. Why don't you help us solve that problem? In some ways, what he was saying is, Liz, make yourself useful. And, and so I figured out, okay, what was important to my boss and my boss's boss? And let me help them figure out how to do that. And it's amazing that when you do that, people just start giving you more space, more latitude. Like people hand you blank checks and say, what do you want to go do? But yeah. in many ways, you have to like, it like... A little humility goes a long way. Yeah. And I think it also seems to be a given, given, you know, especially in bigger organizations where there's so many people, there's people coming and leaving, 
you know, there's there's few people, and it depends on the organization if they stuck around for like 10, 20 years and people know them. Most of the time, you're dealing with a lot of people you don't know that well. And then the aspect that matters is credibility, right? That you talk about quite a bit. And I, I just been in a situation literally last week on a project, and it's a change transformation project. So everyone's new. I'm only getting to know everyone. And there was one one meeting where someone went about in a certain way and I had a check in with um, one of the leadership there and I said, Oh, what's going on there? Do you know what you know that person is doing? And and he was like, Oh yeah, yeah, I know that person for plenty of years. Uh, you know, I trust that person, so that's all fine with me. You know, which is at the point where credibility is totally there and people get a lot of freedom and trust to do what they want. And I think therefore I'd like to, to ask Tell us a little bit about some of, or maybe the, 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 the initial, probably, credibility builders for people that get you there. Because the story you just told sounds similar to, like, solve this problem first, and after that, you actually kind of relax, do more of what you think might be right or it would be supported. So tell us about cred credibility builders, please. Well, I think in building credibility, and particularly building the credibility where people entrust big jobs to you and responsibility to you and give you room and latitude. It's about understanding the agenda. You know, in every organization, there's an agenda and it's rarely the stated agenda. And by agenda, I mean, here's what's important. And I think people who have credibility in organizations are people who come in and they figure out what's important. A little acronym I use is just like, what's a win? What's the win? What's important now? And it's rarely kind of what's published in the strategy document. It's like, what are people spending time on? What do people talk about? What do they seem to care about? And, and it's finding out what's important to somebody else and making it important to you. Um, you know, this is, this is not in the book, but this just reminds me of a story. It was uh, a professor of mine told, and um, he had a young son. He was a teenager and they spent the summer traveling around the United States, going to every major ballpark, baseball park. And at the end of the summer, one of his friends, this is Jay Bonner Ritchie, one of his friends said, oh, Bonner, I didn't know you liked baseball that much. And Bonner, who's very academic, you know, was like marched with Martin Luther King. You know, he's like, oh, I don't, but, but I love my son that much. And it just has always stuck with me about, you know what, find out what's important to the people around you and then make it important to you. And it really changes your relationship. You build a lot of credibility doing that. And um, one of the things that I did going in um, to the research, this book is probably my favorite part of the research was um, we asked 170 managers to tell us about, you know, their impact players compared to, you know, strong, steady contributors. Essentially what we're looking at is what do, smart, capable, hardworking people who are doing a good job do versus what do smart, capable, hardworking people who are making a huge impact do? And like, what are the subtle differences in there? And in that process, um, I asked 170 managers, what do employees do that you most love? You know, and they're, they're telling me, oh, here's what I love. And then what do people do that you most hate? What makes your job as a leader, joyous and what makes your job miserable? I'm telling you, this list is kind of gold. <laughs> it's so. Let me tell you a few things on the top of the list. Um, things that we'll start with things that bosses hate: uh, giving them problems without solutions. Number one, uh, waiting for them to tell you what to do. Like, hey, I'd love to. I'm happy to be helpful. Just like, let me know what you need. Um, make them chase you down and remind you. Uh, don't worry about the big picture, just like do your thing, do your piece. Um, and number five on that list, I've got a list of about 15 here is ask them about your next promotion or raise, you know, and it's not because people don't want to see you being successful. It's like most of the time bosses don't have the authority to be, to be doing that. Here's what they love. Now, of course, it, built into this idea is when you do these kind of things that your leaders hate your credibility is just going down. Like your currency in the organization is going down. When you figure out what's important to the leadership of the organization or to your clients or your community, and then you find out what people love about being a leader and do those kinds of things, like 
your ability to make change and do meaningful work goes up. Okay, on the top of the love list, um, do things without being asked. Um, anticipate problems and have a plan. Help your teammates, um, like make work easy for them. Do a little extra and be curious and ask good questions. Like that's what managers love the most. And you know, when you look at that, in essence, managing, I want people who self-manage. I don't want to have to tell people what to do and then follow up to see if they've gotten it done. I don't want people like, I don't want to be the problem solver. I don't even want to be the director of the group. I think most leaders want to be facilitators of that process. And they actually love it when people say, you know what, I saw this problem on the horizon and I just taken the liberty of fixing it before it became a big issue. You know what? Nobody asked me to do this, but it looks like someone needs to do this. So I, I just took charge and did it. Or would it be okay if I took charge and did it? This is what, what leaders love. Yeah. Um, it's really, really good. And, and it's clear across the entire book that you laid out these, these kind of things with really, really good, tangible, real world examples. And the interviews of 170 leaders, you know, as you say, it's gold. And then you know, spilling that out into the book is is great it's it's really amazing that you can do that um, i work with a lot of startups and startups don't have generally speaking much clue about sales and i typically say if the person you're talking to is not going to get a promotion or get a bonus or get a raise by the use successfully of your product you're talking to the wrong person but that requires the curiosity that you require that you kind of mention what's important and what's valuable and what's going on and what's happening and what are your problems and that whole investigation. So whether you're inside trying to be an impact player or whether you're outside as a startup trying to sell into a, a medium or large organization, a lot of those skills definitely sort of apply. But I want to, mm. I want to move on yeah, to yeah. go on. Well, you know, maybe we'll we'll get to this idea of like the value of perspective taking, but in that scenario, in some ways, you know, all we, we have to do is just ask ourselves, like, what does success look like for this person? Yeah, what does good look like is one of my then, favorite questions. Yeah. And then maybe just ask them, like, what does success look like for you? It is one of my favorite questions to just say, I, I just want to know how you define success in this meeting, in this project, in this purchase. And when you know that piece of information, you're like, okay, now I can find a way for you to be successful, which is going to increase the chance for that I'm going to be successful too. Right. Um, so now I've got a, a different short story. I worked for a company and they had done two rounds of layoffs. And we'd gotten to the point we needed to do another round of layoffs. And we all had, had eight members of my team that were left. And we'd been cutting the dead wood to where the point there wasn't any more dead wood. And I put forward my list of people to, to make redundant. And I picked two from the top and I picked two from the middle. And my manager at the time was like, what the heck are you doing? I said, well, look, the two guys at the top are so gifted and they're so talented. They will go out and find new jobs relatively easily. The, the two in the middle will, will, will be okay. But what we cannot have is six prima donnas. Because if we have six prima donnas, we've got nobody to actually do the work. And we, we, need, we need a balance. A nightmare scenario. Yes. And so my question is, can you have an entire team of impact players or do you need some regular standard contributors? Steady Eddie. Steady Eddie. Just, contribute. just, just to get the jobs that need to do done, who show up to collect their paycheck. Does everybody need to be an impact player? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't think you can have, or I don't know that you would want to work on a team of, of prima donnas, of superstars. You know, there aren't enough green rooms to go around. There's not enough stars on the doors to dole out to everyone. But can you have a entire team of impact players? Well, see, that's a different question, but you have to understand a little bit of the anatomy of these kind of, of, of people. So when I asked 170 managers to describe 
their impact player, someone who was inordinately influential, impactful, delivering incredible value. Not a single one of the 170 people was someone that I would consider a prima donna. And certainly not someone they considered a prima donna. Um, they weren't they weren't bulls in China shops either. These weren't these like self-driven, forceful kinds of, of contributors. They were team players. They were maybe um, extremely talented and capable, but it wasn't like they were pursuing their own agenda. They were, you know, they were doing what was important to the organization. They were focused on serving. They were taking what was important to others and making it important to them and then bringing their extraordinary capability to bear on that. Um, and then, of course, they were influencers that said, okay, and I think we need to do this next and that next. They were people who um, team members willingly followed. And it wasn't like they were doing something different. They were doing something more. Let me um, give you just a couple examples. What we find is that the hardworking contributor, like they do their job well. The difference with them and the impact player is the impact player does the job that needs to be done, not just their job. Meaning they're willing to look beyond their job scope or description to go out and help clean up the messy problems of the organization or go out and get involved in opportunities that don't fit nicely in any one person's job. But they're not people who abandon their job. It's like, I, I do my job, but I'm also willing to do the job that needs to be done. When roles are unclear and it's, you know, we're collaborating and we know there's a bunch of us involved here and we all bring capability, but we're not really sure who's in charge. Like these are people who are willing to take charge. You know, they don't wait. You know, other people are like, okay, I'm following my leader. So I'm going to wait to be told I'm in charge. These are people who say, you know what? Nobody's stepping up to lead this meeting. It's unclear who's in charge. I'll, I'll step in and I'll take charge. But it's a stewardship and a service to the group because what I thought was so remarkable about these people is not that they're take charge folks. Like that's not a big surprise. It's that they're willing to step up, but they also are as willing to step back. Meaning, hey, I'm leading this one part of the project, but I will as aggressively follow Marcus on the part that he's leading, you know, as I am about aggressively stepping up and leading. So there are people who have this very fluid orientation to leadership. So it's not like a team where everyone needs to be the leader all the time. It's a team of people who would say, okay, I'll take that. I'll lead that. Okay. You got that. And they follow as easily as they lead. Um, you know, they're the kind of people who, you know, make work light for others. They're easy to work with. So my, my example of that in my real world life is dinner in a group. I am very, very happy to follow along at the back of the pack and let somebody else make decisions. I've been making decisions all day long. If you want to decide where we're going and what we're eating, I'm really happy to do that. After seven and a half minutes of indecision, I'm in the front of the pack and I've decided where we're going and we're all sitting down within 10 minutes. But I'm happy to kind of step up and I'm happy to, to step yeah. back. Troy, you know, it's funny that you mentioned like dinner and selecting a restaurant because it's the, it's the use case in some ways that I was thinking about as I was writing this chapter about this fluid form of leadership. It's like when there's a group of people and there's no decision being made, like, okay, I'll step in and do this, but I don't have to make every decision that we make as a team. I'm doing it because there's a leadership vacuum. Yeah. Not a land grab. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, <laughs> and uh, as usual, we have uh, more questions than we have time and would love to talk for hours to you. However, so I'm starting to wrap with sort of a last question and, uh, it's one that has a really great story attached to it. So please tell us about, and maybe about an impact player view from the point of a fuzzy, <laughs> as you <laughs> mentioned it in the book. Oh tell my goodness. Story, um, I love that you asked about the fuzzies. The fuzzy idea defined my career. So I joined Oracle. Troy said, you know, he worked there as well. I joined back in the, you know, 
in 88, um, still fairly young, rapidly growing Maverick software company. I joined out of business school. Most of the people they're hiring are coming out of, um, you know, engineering programs, com computer science programs, and they're coming out of the top schools in the nation. And we start in this boot camp. And it's mostly, you know, uh, these folks that have come in with these engineering degrees and then a few people like myself from business school, a few people with liberal arts degrees. And we're put in this boot camp. And um, the night before the boot camp starts, it's like a social hour and, you know, it's mixed mingle. And then they decide that, OK, we need to we're going to start working on this project as soon as we begin the boot camp. And the organizer of this boot camp, she announces, she goes, OK, we're going to like form teams. And she says, Techies on this side of the room, fuzzies on that side. All the, the people with the CS and the engineering degrees, they go over to this techie side of the room. And I'm like, I don't think I'm a techie. I think I'm probably a fuzzy. But, you know, it didn't take a genius to figure out that a fuzzy was not necessarily a term of endearment. It was a sign of, it was like lesser talent. And like, okay, fuzzies over here. And I remember moving over to the fuzzy side of the room going, okay, that's probably a description of my background, but I knew instantly what was important inside the company. And, and it was back to that moment where that VP said to me like, Hey Liz, I know you want to start a management boot camp, but we have a different problem. We've got to figure out how to get a bunch of, you know, people up to speed in Oracle technology. Like, why don't you help with that? And I knew they needed instructors and I wanted to teach, but I was woefully underqualified to be teaching a bunch of hotshot programmers from MIT how to code. And, and so it seemed ridiculous, but they were like, why don't we need a technical trainer in boot camp?" And so I volunteered to do it because one, it needed to be done. And two, I could tell that this was a skill set that was valued. And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to learn how to do this. And actually it was, um, uh, one of my one of my colleagues, and she was one of those people who was over on the techie side of the room. She's like, Liz, we're going to teach you to think like a programmer. She's like, you're not thinking like a programmer. You know, you we're trying to build this app and you're like changing all these things. She goes, this is how a programmer thinks. You isolate variables, you, you know, test one thing, you, you know, fix the bug, you recompile your code, you test it, then you go to the next thing. I'm like, oh, it seems like a slow methodical process. But it taught me a way to think. And um, for, so for me, this fuzzy thing was, was saying that figure out what's valuable inside the organization. And even if you don't have that skill set natively, like learn to think this way, learn to understand this. And, you know, I'm also on a mission to say like, you know what, skills and capability come in a lot of different forms and the best leaders don't Absolutely. divide a room into techies and fuzzies. They say everyone brings, everyone <laughs> brings an important capability. Absolutely. And especially, you know, given the years and years you've worked on projects, and it's also that organizations often don't even know exactly what they need to be doing. So it's really good to have a skill set to figure out and help figure out what needs to be done, what actually brings value yeah. to become an impact player. Liz, thank you so much for your time and all your insights. It was lovely talking to you. So very nice you talking very to you both. And um, Troy, I'm very delighted to know that you spent some uh, quality time at Oracle. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-host Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com. 